Yeah, well, let's continue. So we're moving to, to four under this, this, these explanations about suffering. So you can go ahead and turn to the book of Job. I think perhaps no form of suffering is harder to understand than innocent suffering. Not in the sense that someone's sinless, but in the sense that God's not repaying them at all for anything they've done. Because God doesn't repay us, never treats us, and deals with us according to our sins, is what the scripture says. And uh, I, think, I think the best way to describe, uh, the word I like is fellowship here, and, um, or communion would be a way to tackle this. I think it'll make more sense when we, once we get going, but I think, it, you know, to me it's overlooked, misunderstood. Um, in cases of innocent suffering, we don't, we're not suffering because of personal growth or, or personal sin or growth or even merely the brokenness of this world. I mean, sure, we might grow through it. We suffer in order to grow in fellowship and communion with God in a deeper, more powerful way. I think this is the focus of Job and is vital for suffering well. You have this quote by Eric Ortland again. <clears throat> he wrote two books on a lot of it's on Job. He wrote a book called, do y'all know like Ray Ortland? Do you know that name? Okay, Ray, and you probably know Dane Ortland, maybe. So Eric is his son, um, also his son, and he's in England. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Suffering Well and Wisely that I quoted a lot yesterday. I'll quote a couple times. He wrote a book in that, in that gray uh, biblical theology series by Dr. Carson. You know which one I'm talking about with... Um, Well, Slave of Christ is one of the ones that I love in that book by uh, Murray Harris. Neither Riches or Poverty by uh, Craig Blomberg. Different people. G.K. Beale's written a couple things in there. He wrote a book called Piercing Leviathan, which is a, basically it's, all of it is on the second speech of God to Job, um, where, where God talks about behemoth and Leviathan. It's a very, very provoking book and so we'll get into some of that but so that's why I went back and read Suffering Well and Wisely which is a little bit more of like a book you'd hand out in church because the other one is pretty <laughs> dense but all right so it says the book of Job is not not very well understood in our context having taught and preached the book of Job in both academic pastoral settings for more than a decade my sense is that most Christians are mostly or entirely unfamiliar with this book to my mind, this is tragic. How many can relate to that? I mean, interact with people that just seem very unfamiliar with the book of Job. Yeah, I think absolutely. I feel like even my own life took a long time. I mean, I was raised in the church, but I feel like I had to learn so much along the way. And To my mind, this is tragic because Job's story is extremely common. I've lost count of how many people have approached me after I've taught or preached part of the book and told me they know someone whose life reflects Job's story or that their own does. Even more poignant, which is just kind of significant, I guess, uh, is the mingled surprise and clarity that these Christians express as the book of Job helps them understand their predicament. I've also been told more times than I can count about the help that other Christians offer modern-day Job's, which usually only deepens their bewilderment and pain. And uh, parenthetically, we resemble Job's friends more than we realize. How many read the book of Job and was like amening Job's friends? I remember the first time I read it. I'm like, hey, wait, these guys aren't helpful, actually, <laughs> you know? Uh, God does not wait for, now this is a sobering sentence, God does not wait for us to have a perfect understanding of the Old Testament's most difficult book before leading us into a time of pain and loss similar to Job's. Christians need to be wise about this book if we are going to suffer well. I'm sure you can relate to that as well. Um, so you guys have covered the book of Job, but we're going to break it out in kind of four major bullets. Job is a sincere believer but suffers inexplicably. 
So right at the beginning, and we'll read it to set the context, uh, Job 1, very old book. I think a lot of people say this is the oldest book in the, in the canon. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. He would rise early in the morning, offer burnt sacrifices according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my, sin, my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Later in verse 8, if you just hop down briefly in verse 8, it says there was... The Lord says, there was none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man. Verse 2, 3 says a similar statement. There was none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man, a man who fears God and turns away from evil. And so you, you get this picture, obviously a very prosperous man, but most importantly, a righteous man. And, you know, uh, oftentimes we think about righteous, and this is old hat for you guys, so I won't belabor it, but... When our church here is righteous, they think uh, perfect, you know. They think of it more in like a justification sense. Righteous, righteous in the way it's used in the book of Job, it just means a sincere believer. It's not talking about a perfect believer. It's talking about one who lives sincerely, one who confesses his sins, turns from the Lord, and lives sincerely. And that's what you see in Job, you know. You see him fearing God, turning away from evil. He's blameless in the sense that um, nothing can be reasonably lodged against his character he's even i mean i think the picture with his kids you know it may be that they sin so he offers sacrifices for them so he's not just obeying the law as i think deuteronomy commands us uh, again and again he's going beyond mere obedience to the law uh, and showing exceptional character so an exceptional man it's job is a real sincere believer but he suffers inexplicably and, and, you know, we'll, we'll come back to these little sections. But first, Satan, uh, you know, takes away essentially all his possessions. And then Satan attacks him personally, you know, attacks his body with boils and different things. And it's important to remember that Job 1 and 2 are God's opinion of Job. They're the back story. They're the divine, you know, uh, throne room of God, the... Uh, which, you know, Satan is there to report to the Lord. We won't dive into all of what that means. But it's important to remember that Job 1 and 2 are unknown to Job throughout the book and also unknown to his comforters. So they don't, they don't know God's opinion. That's part of what makes it a tricky book. So why does Job suffer? Now, quite obviously, right here at the beginning, Job does not suffer because of personal sin. Job's counselors have a hard time understanding this reality. They, they continually go back to some form of man reaps what he sows. You know, really their speeches don't uh, really alter in theology very much. They continually kind of say, you must have, you, you must have sinned, that's why you're suffering. And they, they kind of stay on that theme. Job uh, 4, 8, and 9, I have just one little excerpt for you as i have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same by the breath of god they perish and by the blast of his anger they are consumed so man reaps what he sows those who plow iniquity sow trouble they reap it so that's what they're saying uh christopher ash calls this did, did, when josh went through that did he talk a lot about christopher ash or that was a long time ago more eric Ortland. I think this is very helpful. Chris Rash calls this their system of theology. Do y'all have that right there? It's from his commentary. Um, well, it's from his, his other book. But Chris Rash, he, he said essentially their system of theology breaks down into five points. One, this is Job's uh, counselors. God is absolutely in control. 
Two, God is absolutely just and fair. Three, therefore God always punishes wickedness and blesses righteousness. For if he were ever to do otherwise, he must necessarily be unjust. Right? That's why they can't imagine that anything else is going on but that Job sinned in some way. Three, or four, therefore if I suffer, I must have sinned and am being punished justly for my sin. So God's absolutely in control. God's absolutely just and fair. Therefore, he always punishes wickedness, blesses righteousness. Four, if I suffer... I must have sinned and am being punished justly for my sin. Five, even though they don't hit this category, presumably if I am blessed, I must have been good, although this isn't relevant here, so I don't develop this side of it. I think that's helpful because it, it seems right, and, it, and we'll talk more about the kind of the legal frame that comes. But the most important thing right now is that Job does not suffer because he sinned. Uh, secondly, Job does not suffer because of the loving discipline of God. Job's counselors also assume Job's suffering is the loving discipline of God. Job 5.17, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore despise not the discipline of the Almighty. What's that sound like? What what, blessed is the one God reproves. Therefore despise not. What's that sound like? What? Yeah, Hebrews and Proverbs 3. You know, don't be weary at the discipline of the Lord. I mean, it's right there. But Christopher Ash helpfully says, Job's sufferings are not the loving discipline of God. Job is not a morally upright man who has embraced ideas above his station, above his status. Job is a believer. Job is in the right before God, ultimately by faith in Christ who was to come, as was Abraham, his patriarch. So he's helped, Christopher Ash is slowly helping us see what's going on. So he's not suffering because of personal, personal sin, but nor is it merely the loving discipline of God, as if God is trying to purposely work things out of his life. The reality is Job suffers because he is a sincere believer. That's what we learn from Chapter 1, let's go back there and just look from 6 to 12. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on, on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he'll curse you. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So essentially, Satan says, Job trusts you because you bless him. Like Job is a hired man. He's a mercenary. You use that language, I don't know, but it's just, it's a guy you hire to fight for you, even though he's not one of you. Well, that's what that's what that's what God said, or that's what Satan's saying about Job. Job's just a hired gun, you know. He's just a man that you're paying him off. You're giving him good things, and that's why he's 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 seeing. So he's he's the Lord actually is setting forth the ultimate uh, 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 dilemma to show forth how sincere Job is. So mysteriously, God puts forward Job as one to tempt precisely because he's a true believer. The heart of the book of Job is right here. This is what Eric Ortland says. And this is in that piercing Leviathan book. Do God's people love and fear him for his own sake as an end in himself? Should be a question mark there. Or is God used as a means to some other earthly end, such as having enjoyable lives? Will we enter into a relationship with God in which we, all we ultimately gain is God? Can we keep the secondary blessings we accrue 
in that relationship truly secondarily, secondary and dispensable? Or are we too selfish? The question is a very great one. For a relationship with God, for God's sake only, is surely the only kind of relationship that will save us. So it's, it's a most important thing going on. Uh, God is going to display in the life of Job to show that Job worships God only for God. And obviously, it's, it's quite a thing. Chris Rash says, and I think this is uh, very helpful, kind of along the same lines, it is necessary, necessary for it to be publicly seen by the whole universe that God is worthy of the worship of a man or a woman and that God's worth is in no way dependent upon his gifts. The glory of God is more important than your or my or Job's comfort. So, you, you, you know, you see a devastating blow against prosperity theology or self-fulfillment theology, which says that, that God, God's blessings always tied to gift. Well, well uh, the true character of a disciple is shown in worshiping God. So, how does God prove Job is a sincere believer? By permitting innocent, inexplicable suffering. Now, this is crucial. God treats Job like he is an unrepentant sinner. God treats Job like he is guilty of the worst personal sin, even though he's blameless. It can be no other way. It's only in treating Job like he is an unrepentant sinner that Job will be proven to be a sincere believer. Michael Fox says it like this, inexplicable suffering has a role in the divine economy and the divine working for it makes true piety possible. So you understand what's going on uh, and, and, and what the Lord, you know, the only way the Lord can prove true piety in one sense is in the stripping away of anything else but God. And so, and I think it goes back to that Christopher Ash quote, it must be seen publicly by the whole universe, God's worthy of worship, and his worth is, no, is in no way dependent upon his gifts. And so inexplicable suffering has a role because it makes true piety possible. Does that make sense? So that God can be worshipped for his glory alone. B, Job suffers greatly. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's the crisis of faith that Job is brought into. You know, and we'll get to the end in a moment, but I think, um, but yeah, yeah, I think he's brought into that crisis of faith, but, it, but it's also to display to the world um, the, the value and the worth of God and uh, the glory of God. I mean, it's a, it's a terrifying book if you really believe that, you know, but... I mean, this morning I was even reading uh, Luke 14 where our Lord says some pretty terrifying things. If anyone comes after me does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even his own life can't be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross, whoever doesn't count and renounce all he has. I think a similar thing is going on. And in the, you know, in the wisdom literature laying out for us uh, this dilemma so that we understand. Because I do think, I mean, I haven't like pushed it, but I do think similar to that Keller quote yesterday, were things going all right when I was waiting on your hand and foot? <laughs> Which is a, really a, one of those questions the Lord shouts at you in suffering. There's no doubt. 
there's, there had to be aspects of that. I think the main issue, though, was the crisis for Job was being fearful that, um, that, uh, that being, knowing he was righteous. I mean, he, I don't know how many times he says, I'm, I am righteous, defends himself, and yet being accused of being unrighteous. I think that's really the theme it's playing on more than the crisis of faith, like a, you know, an internal crisis of faith. Any other questions there? Uh, we'll keep marching. Uh, b- so B, Job suffers greatly and continues to be a sincere believer. I think um, you guys know this. Job loses his property and his children. Just left with his wife. Wonderfully says, naked I come from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Maybe we should sing that today or tomorrow. <clears throat> and then Job loses his health, you know. And there, there, I think, you know, once you take everything away, the only way to hurt us even more is health. And you guys all know when you start to, Afflictions that afflict your body afflict you in a unique way. And so uh, it's the most distressing thing. So much of the rest of the book is Job wrestling with the meaning of his suffering. And it's not pretty. It's not a pretty book, you know. It's not clean and tidy. Job wishes he'd never been born multiple times. Job wishes he could die. Job complains that his life has no hope. Job complains that God is causing him to suffer. Job Job continually contends that he is blameless. And in in several places, remarkably, continues to hope in God. So he he displays throughout the book, even in the midst of, and we'll get into kind of his, his complaints and laments, but... um, He continues to be a sincere believer. So point C, God affirms his absolute sovereignty over the world and over Job's suffering. So flip, if you would, to Psalm, I mean, to not Psalm, uh, Job uh, 38. You know, in the first speech, God essentially declares to Job that he's the creator who rules over everything. You know, were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Who determined their measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line? What were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstones? On and on and on. Who shut up the sea with doors? Who bur- when it burst from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment, thick darkness and swaddling bands? Twelve. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? <laughs> Or cause the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. Essentially, God is 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 telling Job and 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 really declaring to Job his absolute sovereignty over everything that happens throughout the earth. If you look in in in, um, in verse in chapter 40, so he ends that first speech. Says, shall his fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. I think it's a sim- similar to like Romans 9 type of response. Shall, shall, shall the clay like argue with the potter? And so Job essentially bows before him and says, you're the king. He shuts his mouth in awe. You know, uh, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, preaching on Romans 3, that no one can be a Christian until they shut their mouth. <laughs> Talking about the, the proclamation of, of the holiness of God and the reality of sin for all of us. There's a similar thing that must happen in Job's life. A, a, a shut in his mouth in awe at the absolute sovereignty of God. But does that answer Job's question? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, in, in one sense, like God's answer is sufficient. I am absolutely sovereign. And you are a creature, right? Like, like we sang yesterday, a worm. Well, he definitely did nothing wrong, and he knows that. And I think ultimately he says he knows he's righteous. And in one sense, I'd say the first speech is, is all the Lord. The Lord doesn't know him anything, but uh, the Lord, that could have been a sufficient answer. But I think the, 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 one of the things you would see if you, if you read through it and we had time to dive into it is essentially <clears throat> Job is wrestling with his eye that there's a monster after him. Essentially, he's wrestling with the evil one. And so the question after the first speech is that God's absolutely, or God is sovereign, God's powerful, but the question left is, is God the monster that brought this all down on me? One, and is, or if, if he is not, is God stronger than the monster that brought this down on me? Does that make sense? I think he's left with two questions. Is God the monster? So implication from that first speech, is God, is God then the monster that brought this down on me? And if not, is he stronger than the monster? And that's what sets up this next speech that includes Behemoth and Leviathan, which my kids always ask, are those the dinosaurs, you know? <laughs> but, you know, because it just praises this, these great destructive powers of e evil and yet praises God as being sovereign over them. Like, uh, let's, let's look just at uh, 41, 41, 9. The hope of man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. The Lord is declaring that this ruthless creature is under the throne of God, or under the rule of God. Go back to verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook, or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? And to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Will you put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders, traders bargain over him? Divide him up among merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons and his head with uh, fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it. Essentially, uh, and, and Chris Rash helps us here. As Job suffers, his greatest and deepest fear is that the monster who attacks him is unrestrained, that the attacks will go on forever with unrelieved ferocity, and that the monster has been given a free hand, unlimited access to Job and his life. He is afraid that there is no sovereign God who has evil on a leash. Let's go to that next quote. Even the mystery of evil is, his, is God's mystery. Even Satan, the Leviathan, is God's Satan, God's pet, if we dare to put it like this. This means that as we suffer, we may with absolute confidence bow down to this sovereign God, knowing that while evil may be terrible, it cannot and will not ever go one tiny fraction beyond the leash on which God has put it, and it will not go on forever. So what's, what really what's going on is, is we're helping to see why this began in the heavenly council and why there's this startling scene where Satan reports to, to Job. Job never knew this, but what, 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 uh, what Job is learning in this moment is that the creation is not dualistic. It's not like, it's not like the good battling the evil, you know, like Star Wars or something like that. It's not light versus darkness. It's not a, a tug of war where God's trying to gain as much ground as he can. What, what, what God is declaring to Job is that all of creation is under his rule and that Satan, too, is under his rule. So it, it's still unspeakably mysterious. 
But that's what he's opening up to, to Job and saying, while evil may be terrible, it cannot and will not go one tiny fraction beyond the leash on which God has put it. And it will not go on forever. I'm sure we'll have some questions as we keep going, but the needed response to this suffering is to cling to God and do not curse Him. All Job gains, Eric Ortland says, from his suffering is God and more of God. He continues, we learn from Job that sometimes God allows us to suffer not because he's angry, not in order for us to, or to cause us to grow into deeper Christ-likeness, but only as a means of giving himself to us more deeply. He is, in fact, about the business of saving our souls and fitting us for eternity in doing so. For a relationship with God in which God is loved for his own sake and not as a means to some other end is the only kind of relationship that will save us. The book of Job also teaches us that God's request, this is, I think, vital. The book of Job also teaches us that God's requirements of his saints when un undergoing a kind of Job-like suffering are surprisingly minimal. Like Job, all we have to do is hold on to our relationship with God and not curse him. I think that is incredible. Like, it's amazing. And so I think when you get people in these inexplicable suffering that can't be traced back, really to hold out before him, before them, all you need to do is hold on to God. Don't curse him. It doesn't mean like all the other, you know, we talked yesterday about the, the other explanations for suffering. Aren't, these aren't mutually uh, exclusive. You know, there's going to be overlaps in our lives, but it does help us understand how to help. It definitely doesn't answer all the questions. But it definitely helps us put, our, put people's lives back together and put, our, put much of the scriptures together too. I think what, what I think this, like creating category for fellowship and communion as an explanation for suffering helps us put our Bible together. You know, briefly, like I think it, it captures, a, or it helps us put into a category what some songs of lament are. Like Psalm 113, or Psalm 13, how long, O Lord? You know, at uh, 42, like you referenced singing last week, um, uh, as a deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you. 55, which is devastating, essentially talking about being betrayed, much like our Lord was betrayed, and uh, betrayed by a close friend, and, and yet it, it, it talks about... Um, Somebody crying out to the Lord. I think the same thing's going on in Habakkuk. You know, after learning that God is going to discipline the people of Israel to the ba wicked Babylonians, ba uh, Habakkuk bows in awe, and he says those wonderful words, though a fig tree should blossom, nor, no, the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll take joy in the God of my salvation. It's everything's being stripped away and I'm communing with the Lord. Uh, flip with me to Mark 5. This is one of the most provoking stories. I just keep going back to it in my head. That I think illustrates this well. You guys know this story, the, the healing of the um, uh, disease-ravaged woman while, the, while Jesus is walking up um, uh, to, to go... To go um, raised Lazarus or Jairus's daughter from the dead and and so here's this woman who's been you know uh, suffering for 12 years you know it's carefully outlined in the passage the uh, Jairus's daughter is 12 years old this woman's been suffering for 12 years you know she's facing a problem that she can't handle she's gone to all these different doctors and different things and and uh, and has found no solution 
But she, she comes up behind the Lord, and we'll just uh, uh, read this briefly. Like in verse 27. So right above that, it talks about all that she had spent. She's no better and far worse. She heard reports about Jesus. That's amazing. Came up from behind him in the crowd, touched his garment. For he said, if I, if, or she said, if, I guess she said in her head, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. On the one hand, you would think, like, miracle over, let's get going on to Jairus' house so he can heal Jairus' daughter. But I think what the Lord does in response presses home what this communion thing is all, this fellowship is all about. Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, which is amazing to think, like, what in the world? What did he perceive? Immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? You know, and the disciples are like, you're crazy. You know, it's an absurd question. How could you know there's crowds all around you? Disciples are thinking, who didn't touch your garments? You know, there's people everywhere. But Jesus is not asking for information. It's not like he doesn't really know who touched his, dar- his, his garments. He's summoning this lady to him. And so, verse 32, he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and you'll be healed of your disease. Now, you know, the reason I think this illustrates what's going on is this woman, so this woman is unclean for 12 years so she wanted to sneak in behind Jesus's back and essentially just receive the healing this woman wanted a miracle but Jesus wanted a meeting this woman wanted healing but Jesus wanted a face-to-face this woman wanted a power encounter Jesus wanted a personal encounter and so Jesus wants a real relationship with her I think the mystery of her suffering is not the resolving of a problem Wonderfully, the Lord does that, but, but the restoration of relationship. Restoring her to right relationship with the Lord. And so it's striking in this context when they're talking about Jairus' daughter. Then the Lord says to this woman who's been unclean for 12 years, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed. I think that's what's going on. Like a, It helps us understand So suddenly this lady understands what all that suffering was about so that it might bring her to an encounter with Jesus Christ and to fellowship with him. Um, I want to say a few few things of application and then we'll we'll, uh, we'll provide some time for Q&A. The first is Job is long. Reminding us that sincere believers may suffer for a long time. I mean, that's an implication. But nevertheless, I think it it holds up. It's 42 chapters long. Christopher Ash says, most preachers preach one one message on chapter 1, one message on chapter 2, get one of the rookie associate pastors to preach on chapters uh, uh, 3 through 38, and then the senior pastor brings it home on 39 through 42. And one time we did this at our church, and, and our senior pastor did exactly that. And he read, well, he read Ash's like statement after he'd already begun the series, but it was four messages. And, he, and Ash really strongly warns against it. But, I mean, you try to preach a message, I mean, one per chapter, and your people are going to be suicidal. <laughs> you know, it's such a, I mean, it's... It's going to be, but the point, I think, is sincere believers may suffer for a long time. And brothers, we have to, sisters too, we have to have this in our, in our tool bag. You know, we have to have this in our understanding. It's utter folly. 
to think that suffering can be changed with a few thoughts. Two, Job is dark, reminding us that sincere believers may become very discouraged in suffering. Christopher Ash says, a real believer can go through utter despair and desperation. A blameless believer who has not fallen into sin might go through utter dereliction. The, 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 the feeling that they have been completely forsaken by God and yet at the end be judged a real believer. So not only like will it be a long time, sometimes suffering will be very, very dark. At one point in William Cooper's life, William Cooper was, was, um, was suicidal. So he wrote, there's a fountain filled with blood. Um, God moves in a mysterious way. Uh, other songs. Oh, but basically, he lived with John Newton and John Newton's wife. And they say that, uh, Newton said, that during a, I think it was like a five-year period, that he did not leave William Cooper for longer than eight hours for five years. And the hymns that he actually wrote were an assignment from John Newton. So he said, let's write hymns together. I mean, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, you know, and as one of those hymns. But it was because of his commitment to stay with a believer in the midst of his dark, dark suffering. And so, how to help. I think when people are at this stage, uh, it's tricky. There's no, there's no perfect answer, but one of the things is, is, to, is to stay there and stay close. Um, but I, I just think like these sentences are gold. Like you, you say that to somebody, a real believer can go through utter despair and de- desperation, utter dereliction, and yet in the end be judged a real believer. Um, and we don't know, you know? And so I think in so many ways, like we need to step back. Don't, don't put our grid on this. Well, you're not acting like a believer right now, you know, or whatever. Like get that stuff out because it won't help. 